Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the time of year when I schedule my annual fiscal. I figure it's a new year. The insurance company says they're going to pay for it. So why not? I know when I go, though, I'm going to be reprimanded for the extra pounds that I put on, given that the last time I visited, I had left with a commitment, or at least a promise, to come in leaner this time. Not working. So some of what I will be hearing will be bad news. But not really bad news. At least I hope not. It's one of those bizarre ironies, isn't it? I mean, we go to the doctor to get a once-over just in case something is wrong with us that we're not aware of. But we really don't want the doctor to find anything, do we? We want to hear good news. You have a clean bill of health. We don't want to hear good news. We found something we can definitely take care of. You should be thankful that we got it early. I guess that could be good news. Or we could hear something like this. Good news! You have an untreatable terminal disease, and you are so lucky that there is still time to enjoy the day fully. Excuse me? Which of these three good news reports is Jesus giving us? The time is fulfilled, he tells us. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. Is that really the kind of good news we want? Four years ago this week, my mom went to the hospital. She had been struggling with shortness of breath and had oxygen to her sister in the home, but she was having difficulty and was afraid that maybe she had pneumonia. She had COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, an insidious progressive deterioration of the air sacs in her lungs. Over time, one or more factors reduce the ability of oxygen to get into the blood, and that is fatal. That isn't how her doctors explained it to her. They didn't dwell on the negatives. And the same was true in the hospital emergency room. The focus was on treatment, fixing her up and getting her well, getting her back home. Well, some of what the doctor said sounded like good news. Mom didn't have pneumonia. But she did need to stay in the hospital. You know that expression Jesus uses, let those who have ears hear? When the doctor focused on what mom didn't have, my ears stopped hearing what she did have. To be fair, he did try to explain to my sister and me that mom was in serious condition. He said that the latest event was just a hint, a warning of what was yet to come. But what was still ringing in my ears was the good news. She did not have pneumonia. What a relief. She would get better, go back home. We knew that was what she wanted. We had already had many warning signs 
obstacles that we cleared like hurdles in a race. She needed oxygen to help her breathe. Check. She needed to quit smoking. Check. Or at least she told us she did quit. <laughs> she couldn't do any exhausting work. Check. We had someone take care of her shopping and take care of taking her where she needed to go and to take care of cleaning. But these were not hurdles in a straight path. They were bumps and potholes on a steep slope heading downward. Eventually, things would get worse. We kind of knew that. But we also knew that she wasn't dying. We were wrong. I remember four of us standing at the foot of her bed, speaking softly so we wouldn't disturb her as she rested. My brother-in-law, my sister, my wife, and I tried to speak over the sound of the BiPAP machine, which was pumping air towards her mouth so that she could get a little bit more oxygen. If my sister and I had really understood the news we got from the emergency room doctor, we would have taken mom home. We would have spent every waking moment with her, told her how much we loved her, and we would have made her safe, warm, and comfortable. We would have surrounded her with family and friends, and we would have made those final days the best days possible. we would have helped her live what precious little time she had left, really live. Instead, we were speaking softly, trying to comprehend what the nurse meant when she said they would move her to hospice. Several weeks ago, our own Canon Harris told me she had read a book by Dr. Atul Gawande. It's called Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End. It's a fascinating book, a series of interwoven stories about the journey down that steep slope and our own fears and failures in dealing with it wisely. Gawande describes what he calls the greatest failure of medicine, our misguided focus, our failing to understand that there is a big difference between prolonging life and what the medical profession spends most of its time and money on, delaying death. There are many great stories and even better lessons in the book, but what I came away with is a new appreciation for that word, hospice. You see, we didn't get to learn about it and the value of hospice that day. Mom didn't hang around long enough to try, out, try it out. Mom knew how she wanted to spend her time. What she wanted was to have her dog in her lap while she played cards with her family. Not so much to ask. We could have been doing that together if we had heard the good news that there was still time to enjoy each other in this world, making this day the best day possible. Jesus came to remind us that we have a purpose in this life and that purpose is not just to buy time waiting to take up residence in the hereafter. It makes sense if you think about it. God didn't create us to be alone. He didn't lock us away in a cave surrounded by empty walls. He set us in a garden. 
surrounded by plants and animals, trees, fruit, water, everything we needed to sustain us. But he didn't stop there. He gave us purpose by giving us something to do with our time. He had us tend the garden, care for the animals, and bring new life into the world. He gave us work to do, meaningful, life-enriching work. Even there in the garden, we could and should be busy. Left to our own devices, we'll forget that we are created in God's image, created to be actively involved in his kingdom, created to make each day count. And when we forget, and when we find ourselves standing around with our hands in our pockets, waiting for someone to tell us what to do, Jesus comes along with a parable that tells us, what are you doing standing around? Get out in the field with everyone else. And the beauty of it all is we'll be given the same reward if we come late to that game as if we arrived early. Good news. There's still time. You can start now. I don't know about you, but when I hear the words repent, the end is near, that's a big turnoff for me. <laughs> when I worked in New Jersey, each day I would take the car to the train, to the bus, to the ferry. And in that traveling, we would invariably pass by a street corner on 42nd Street with a guy standing there with his PA system and his microphone yelling, repent, the end is near, Jesus is coming. No one paid attention to him. Tomorrow came, and dozens of tomorrows came, and he was still there, and so were we. The routine didn't change at all. Whatever was coming didn't come. Again, I was hearing it all wrong. The kingdom of God has come near, and it has been near for 20 centuries. Just like the doctors who prescribe one treatment after another to keep our hearts pumping and our lungs inflating and deflating, we keep taking the car to the train, to the bus, to the ferry, and put off any thought of what can make this the best day possible. As Gawanda points out, we are called to be authors of our own lives. Not observers, participants, followers of some prescribed plan or roadmap, but authors, co-creators with God, of a living, breathing, fully engaged, empowered, and amazing kingdom right here, right now. But do we listen? Now there are people in this very room who have experienced a close encounter with the kingdom. The wake-up call could have been for themselves, for a loved one, a close friend, or even a stranger. And when those things happen, when we have a brush with death and survive to tell about it, we are right there inside the gates, standing on the hill, looking out at the beauty and splendor of all God's creation, blessed beyond our wildest dreams and expectations. When we thank God for that second chance, that extra moment to be with those we love, that ability to make it there in time to say goodbye, that that is when we know the good news is real. We shouldn't need a wake-up call to begin living, but we do. God knows that. He understands it. He forgives us for it. Even though he had to come to us in person to make us 
understand it, and to wake us up. Repentance is all about letting go of our past and future regrets. Now, while we have a choice, while we have a chance. In his book, Gawanda talks of a time when we get to say, enough! I've had enough of the prodding and poking, the bells and whistles, the buzzes and drips, the monitors and hoses. Let me be. Let me live. Perhaps some of you knew Stephen Clapp from Greenwich. He was a dean at Juilliard, an amazing teacher of music. He played a soul-lifting violin and spread joy and the word wherever he went. A brain tumor took his life a year ago. I got to know Stephen as a member of a non-musical foursome, Wednesday morning Bible study at Grand Central, of all places. It was that group that made me realize I could actually come to love the stories in the Bible, and I have. I haven't been a participant of that group for many years now, but we try to meet at, for lunch at Rockefeller Center at Christmas time every year, just to catch up. We didn't meet last year. Stephen was too ill. But this year when we met, his wife and daughter joined us. We got to share stories and hear of the last, day, last days of our friend's life. Spent at home, surrounded by family and pets. It sounded wonderful. It was what they had all prayed for. This is that time. The kingdom is near. We can live a life of purpose and meaning right now. We can turn off the ventilator and start breathing on our own. We don't hear that as good news because we don't want to be reminded that we're mortal. There may be a day soon when our kids will be standing at the foot of our bed, speaking quietly so as not to disturb us. And inside, we'll be shouting at the top of our lungs, no, not yet, not this way, not without you to hold, to talk to, to be with, and to see through the tears. No matter where we are on our life path, no matter how many bumps and potholes the road has thrown up at us so far, the gates of the kingdom are still flung open, waiting for us to enter and enjoy. Here on earth today, the kingdom is near. Jesus has made it easy for us to take each moment of our time and live it filled to the brim and overflowing with love and grace. Love one another, he told us. Do it now. Don't be afraid to live the best day possible every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.